Anchor fishing is one of the most productive and fun forms of angling you can pursue. There's nothing like dropping your hook in exactly the right position, putting out a great spread of rods and gear, and catching fish after fish for your family and friends. Even if the action is red hot, once everything is in place, you can relax and enjoy a book or even a barbecue. There is little doubt that more salmon and steelhead are caught while on anchor than by any other means. From California to Alaska, the big rivers of the far west are waiting for you to give them a try. Up River Bright right there, beautiful fish. Good job. This fishing video is designed to show you how to set and pull your anchor and to explain the basic gear and techniques you need to be a successful salmon and steelhead angler in a river. And out goes the ball. And then we tie off on our bumper here to make ourselves even with the other boats down here. We want the back of our boat to be even with them. We will show you how to safely set and pull your anchor, even in the crowded conditions that we sometimes face during peak runs. You will see how to rig your gear and what baits and lures work best for which species and at what time of year. In general, we'll provide you with some tools to be a better boatman and angler. The next thing I use is a slider to put my uh, lead dropper line on. And that Our expert and your instructor for this production is Eric Lindy. Eric is a first-class Northwest salmon steelhead and sturgeon guide who is well respected in the industry and on the water. Most important, he's the kind of fishing partner we all would like to have. He knows his stuff and is confident in his angling techniques. Joining Eric in the video is Carmen McDonald. Carmen is a professional in the fishing industry as well whose advertising agency represents a number of top manufacturers in the fishing world. He serves as our host and helps to draw out of Eric some of the hard-won knowledge he has on anchor fishing. Big problems are what you can have if you don't set your anchor properly in a river. Swift current and the long anchor ropes required in such water are a bad combination when not used properly. Anglers are killed every year because they don't know how to anchor properly. The classic big problem unfolds like this. The anchor is thrown out along with all the rope. They are caught in the faster moving current below the boat and are swept downstream faster than the boat itself. The rope wraps in the prop and the now the boat is dead in the water and unable to maneuver. It is pulled downstream with the current. The anchor finally finds something to catch on and grabs hold on the bottom. The boat is spun around and the stern is immediately pulled underwater, swamping the entire boat. This can happen in a heartbeat and the result is anglers in the water and unless they're lucky, they're dead. You can avoid this catastrophe if you follow some straightforward rules and have the proper equipment. It is important to understand a little about anchors to know if you're using them right. Eric and Carmen go over a variety of anchors and their applications. When we get into the bigger water and the river fisheries like we've been in, um, it takes some specialized equipment. So you, can you show us the difference in these anchors and what their application is in moving water? Yeah, current and then bottom composition are our two main items that, that we're dealing with. Um, this anchor here is a sand anchor. It's primarily used in sandy situations. It's what I use in the estuary uh, uh, environment. It's a, called a fluke or a Danforth anchor. Um, that's a 13 pound version. They're lightweight but they've got a lot of holding power because those flukes dig into the sand and then the tine lays flat on the top of the sand and the chain holds it down. And, and that, that really, that, that's whether that works. When you get up into these rocks, it just can't dig in through the rocks. I see a lot of people in the upper river come up here trying to anchor with these kind of and, and it's just sheer by sheer luck that it catches or, or lodges what you really need up in the upper water where you have a rock bottom like this or bigger rocks is what they call a rocking chair anchor this anchor right here is probably the most popular kind they make this in uh, this would be a two tine we, what we call a two tine they make one with a, a third tine or even sometimes four tines um, this particular anchor right here with two is probably take care of 95% of your anchoring situations. How about now we got a big monster over here now? <clears throat> well, they make these in all different sizes. This is again a design anchor, and actually its features are similar to that. This is called a kedge anchor, or we like to refer to it as a Popeye anchor. 
and it's kind of a unique deal. What this is, is when this one's dropped over, it rolls over on its side as it's pulled, and these flukes dig into the dirt like this to the point that it'll be buried up to here. And the application you'd use this in is in shallow, fast water with a gravel bottom. This is a perfect bottom where this anchor here would might have trouble getting something to hold on to to hook up. This big fluke digs into the bottom and really holds a boat. I mean, this has got a ton of holding strength. We've got a little specialty item here. Now, what's, what's the hoop for? Okay, this is a deal that we use in, down in the lower river, there's tons of pile dikes. And in the springtime, uh, we go down there and we'll, we'll fish right behind the pile dikes. We'll pull up the pile dike. And again, we're trying to find the spot where the fish are running. And this thing here allows you just to throw your, your uh, piling ring right over the piling and hang on. You don't have to drop an anchor or anything. And then you just tie up to your, to your pile ring and uh, put a float on the end of your line. And when you hook a fish, you just drift out with it, let the float go, come back, pick it up. And then there's crossbars on most of those pile dikes and we just lift this right back off of there. And it just works slick as could be. It is the rocking chair anchor that Eric recommends for use in a big river. The weight of the anchor depends upon the size of your boat and the general rules are as follows. But keep in mind that both Eric and Carmen believe the bigger, the better. Recommended for a 17-foot boat or smaller is the 25-pound anchor. For an 18 to 20-foot boat, a 30-pound anchor should be enough. And for a 21 to 24-foot boat, they suggest the 40-pound anchor. Rocking chair anchors come in two, three, and four tines. Eric suggests you go for at least the two or three tine anchor. A tine on the anchor runs all the way across, and what you see here is a two tine anchor. The chain that comes off the anchor is an important element to the entire system, and it should be 5 16 inch. The weight of the chain lays the anchor over and allows it to grab on the bottom. The official recommended length is a foot of chain for every foot of boat. Eric believes this is a little overkill and uses 10 to 15 feet for his 40 pound anchor. For connecting the chain to the anchor, you can use either quick links or shackles, also in 5 16 inch diameter. When you, we've talked about adding chain to your systems and adding anchors, adding chains to your anchors, chain to chain. What's the best systems to, to make those connections? You've got a couple different ones here. Well, we've got the quick link. That's this one here, and then this is a, what they call a clevis or a lot of times a shackle. I like the shackles the best. They, they, they work the best. I just use this to connect the bottom of the chain, this 5 16 Then I just use another one to connect the two chains together when I add a length of chain. It's very simple. One other thing that I like about it, you notice a hole drilled in the pin. You can actually take a piece of wire, twist it on there, and keep that pin from coming out. Uh, it's just kind of a little added safety feature that I like. One other deal that we've got is that the threads, a lot of times from banging around in the rocks and, and banging around, the threads and this nut get knurled up and, and these become really hard to get off. And that's another reason that I really like the clevises a little better. Now, the nice thing about this anchor is that if you ever get into a situation in the river where the anchor were to hang up and it, it wouldn't release, you couldn't get loose, it's wedged under a big rock or something uh -huh. here. As you're pulling it with your anchor puller, this will pull and this will actually break away and then this anchor will pull from the bottom and you'll get your anchor back. It'll pull. It'll so release. it'll release out of there. Yeah, and it's really a slick feature. I mean, that's that's really the beauty of that, of that anchor. The rope you use and the knots you tie are as important as your anchor and the way you have it rigged. If your rope is too short, it will not have enough scope and will not hold. In other words, if the angle from your anchor to your boat is too severe, your anchor will want to drag along the bottom rather than catch. Short changing yourself on the length of your anchor rope will make the size of your anchor irrelevant. Eric, we've got a two-tine anchor that's the the best multi-purpose anchor out there. You've got four different looks and ropes here. What? Um, there must be some important about those. Yeah, absolutely. What I do is is I have two different anchors set up, set up at all times. I run a, a sturgeon rope, basically a long rope, and then I have a short rope, which is my, my salmon anchoring rope. Sturgeon fishing generally, we're in deeper, faster water. You need a longer length. We run standard for sturgeon is going to be 300 feet. Um, the other one, salmon, I run 125 to 150 foot rope. And what that does is that gives me enough length that I'm not interfering with people in the hog line above me or below me. Gives me plenty of length and scope in shallow water. Usually, like we talked about earlier, we're, 
we're in you know 15 to 20 feet of water max so that's basically a five to one or better scope on that one and and same five to one five to one five feet of length for every one foot of depth so that you have the proper scope what that does is it gives your anchor a better ability to hold in 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 current because a lot of times with anchoring it's like you said in a lake it's simply you just drop a uh, lead weight over and you, you sit there but when you have current you're you got a lot of different aspects that you have to deal with so that length of rope is very important I, I, I really really believe in that another really overlooked deal in rope is quality number one that that's very important I prefer to use a good quality braided nylon rope now you notice I say braided I don't mean twisted twisted rope a lot of times in the current situation will actually get twisted up where a braided rope you don't have near that problem and nylon rope is very high quality, tough tensile strength, breaking strength. It's amazing mm -hmm. how strong this, this is a 3 8 inch piece of rope and it, breaking strength on that rope is probably 14,000 pounds. I mean, it's amazing strength. Um, the other types of rope that are out there, this is a, what they call a derby braid. And this, all this is is a, is a braided polyethylene rope. It's a, or polypropylene rope. It's, it's plastic, it floats, whereas nylon rope sinks this floats, it's not near as strong, it's a fraction of the braking strength, and as you can see it frays and stuff quite a bit. So this is a lower quality rope. Um, as far as the diameters go, there's, there's, all, there's obviously different diameters of rope, and a lot of times I see guys buying their first anchor rope or their anchor rope, they come out and they buy, they see they got a 20 foot boat, well they need a rope, rope to hold it so they go buy a half or even five eighths inch rope that's how i would have looked at it yeah well <laughs> with this type of braking strength at this three eighths inch rope this is all you would ever need a lot of times when i'm sitting in fast water i'll even shrink down and use a five sixteenths inch rope and the reason being it's just like fishing line the reason being is that there's so much drag on just the rope that it'll help you come off anchor so the less drag that you can get on the rope is the less pull there is on your anchor and the less the less drag there is on that. So that's really an important factor out here. That half inch rope's dragging so hard, it's helping you knock yourself right off anchor. It's your it's your own worst enemy. Now we've got this one's all knotted up here. What what this is, on top of my ropes, on, on all my ropes, like I said, I have ropes made up. What I've done here is this is my 125 foot salmon anchor rope, and I've I've got it coiled up right now. But what this is, is a, what I call a bumper section, and I tie that onto the end of my main nylon rope, and it is, the, it is the polypropylene line that I told you about, the plastic rope that floats. And what that does is when, when I go to set my anchor, it keeps the ball from sliding off the end of my anchor rope, and then I tie up to this, and when I have to drift out with a fish, I can just throw it off. You don't have a problem with the anchor, or the ball sliding off the end of the anchor rope, and that rope floats, so when you come back up, you just take your boat hook, pick it back up, and hook back up to the anchor rope. To review, your anchor rope should be 125 to 150 feet in length for water depths of 40 feet or less, generally for salmon and steelhead fishing in slow to moderate current flows. If you're going to fish in moderate to very fast current in 40 or more feet of water, Eric recommends as much as 300 feet of anchor rope. Your bumper rope remains the same at 30 feet. The general rule of the Army Corps of Engineers is seven feet of rope for every foot of water depth you're anchoring in. Average is five feet of rope for every foot of water, and Eric will fish as little as three feet to every foot of depth. You may, of course, have to shorten up your rope at times depending upon how close it is between the lines of boats. When it comes to the type of rope to use, Eric has only one choice. 3 8 inch braided nylon. Not twisted, but braided nylon. He also prefers 3 8 inch rope for your bumper or mooring rope, but this should be the polypropylene type. It floats and you will be able to retrieve it when you come back to your anchor buoy. There are really only a couple of knots that Eric uses, and he's going to demonstrate both of them for us. Tying to the business end of things, or tying to my anchor, I like the, the bowling. The Bolin is just the best all-around utility knot for anchor, and there is. Very simple. I can sit on anchor all day long with all this force of the river on this knot and still undo the knot at the end of the day. So it makes, it's just, it's my clevis of rope, you know. Uh, it's easy to get undone, all, and it's very simple to do. All you do is put the rope through like that, roll, roll a loop like that, and if you have trouble tying this, this line coming out of here has, the, the exit line going up to your anchor has to be on the bottom of this loop. That's okay. the key. Then, as the old Boy Scouts trick said, 
the rabbit comes out of the hole, goes around the tree and back in the hole. And it's just that simple. And that knot is so easy to get undone because once you tighten it up, all you have to do is break its back back over and you just pull it apart, it comes right undone. And that knot will hold when none others will and it won't come loose. And you know that you have it, you, you know that you have it tied right when it doesn't slide down. And I'll show you what I mean by that. I'll tie it up here a little further. It'll, it'll tighten down on itself or like a slip knot or one of the other knots would slide down. This one stays, that loop would stay that big. It won't slide down the main shaft of the rope. The other knot that I like to use is a connection between my bumper line or my, my, the rope, my floating rope that I used to throw off and my main line. And really this is just an old fly fisherman's knot. It's a nail knot, I believe. And it's really simple to do. And I tie two knots opposing. All you do is take this knot or rope and just wrap that around there. I like to go five or six times, like so. Pull your fingers out, slide that line right up through there. It's simply a nail knot, very simple knot. Pull that out of there. Tighten that up. Just keep working it around and tightening it up. And then that slides through there. And then on the other end of the knot, you just do the same thing. Just wrap it up. Stick that back in there. That'll come right through there like so, and you tighten that one down. Get that good and tight. Now we have two knots tied on opposing lines. Here, you hold on to that and pull, just pull pulls it down and then you just pull on these tag ends and that's a great connection there it is works great and uh, that keeps your your ball from sliding over there and I just always trim your ends up a little leave them a little long because they'll suck into that knot as this tightens up as you're pulling your anchor cut those off and then just take and burn that so it doesn't fray out and it's it's ready to go you've connected your two lines There are a variety of good buoys and anchor pullers available, but across the board, Eric works with Easy Marine products, so those are what we will be demonstrating with. What he considers most important, like with the rest of his setup, is that you go with the larger sizes and better quality. Since literally your life depends upon it, he feels this is no place to cut corners. The buoy balls for river fishing run in a variety of sizes, but Eric prefers nothing smaller than the A3 or A4. This ball has to hold your entire anchor rope and in extreme flows will be sucked under if it isn't large enough. The anchor pullers themselves come in both metal and plastic, but it is only the aluminum puller that Eric uses. This device takes the full force of the current and your boat when you're using it to pull anchor. This is, a, this is a small plastic one, fairly light duty one. This is what most of the guys are using. This is an easy marine puller right here. It's got uh, you know all machine parts with a nice nylon shiv in it and uh, real good heavy duty stuff. A um, couple of deals that you need to be aware of is the size of the ball. A lot of times guys will go buy small anchor and a small ball because they want it to fit in their rope locker or not take up a lot of room in their boat and that's completely the wrong concept on, on anchors and pullers. The puller primary function, if to think of this in, in the right sense of mind, is that we're going to go out there, we're going to drop our anchor and we're going to moor this anchor buoy right here so we can come tie up to it. That's what our goal is. So what you want to do is have a buoy, number one, that will lift your anchor, but number two, it'll also support the rope that you have out there and the drag on the rope. We talked about it earlier, how important diameter is in your anchor, choosing your anchor line. A lot of guys will come out here with that big half inch rope. They'll get out here in a ripping current and throw that anchor out there and they'll have a little small ball like that. And the drag of the line will actually suck the ball underwater. So you want to have a ball that's, that's a good sized ball. So with the combination of the rope running through this, we're not there at the front of the boat pulling the anchor with our backs. No. This is this item is able to be set up so that it, with the combination with the boat, you can pull the anchor with, using the power of the boat instead of the power of your back. That's correct. And what, what will we do is we take and the rope will run through this. How you would rig this would be you take your anchor line and you got to think of this thing as being upside down. So you want to look at it like this. So what 
what you need to do is pull these arms up like this and slide the locking device right here back and just insert the rope through here and then pull it through and then this you tie to your anchor rope okay okay then you drop that you drop this the anchor into the river and I'll show you how to do that a little bit later and then you let out all your anchor line then what you want to do when you get ready to pull you just fire up your boat make sure you're tied off to the bow of your boat pull around your ball and just go straight up your anchor line you know not over the top of it but alongside of it don't get your prop, prop caught in it you'll just run up river and then when it's pulled all the way to the end of the rope this the weight of the anchor will cause that to go down and and it'll, what it does is if you were the anchor it would hold it right up there right up tight to that ball and and it's wonderful you just turn around coil your pull your rope into your boat pick your anchor up and it's there it's the ball's floating your anchor and it's pulled it right off the bottom of the river for you Before we get on the water, Eric and Carmen are going to go over the whole anchoring system on shore. It is critical that you understand how the anchor system operates if you're going to use it successfully and safely. Okay, what we got is basically plenty of anchor. You want to have enough anchor. This two-tine rocking chair anchor is going to take care of 90% of your 90% of your situations. You're going to run chain um, chain length dependent on time of year and water flow. It's used to hold the tine, this, this tine right here down. It adds weight to that and keeps it so that it doesn't lift up like that and drag it down the river. On the chain, you gotta have a breakaway, a way to pop this loose from here so this, when you're pulling your anchor with the ball, it can come back here and pull at this angle so we don't lose these anchors. Then the next thing that we need to do is tie onto that chain with a knot. A good working knot is a bowling knot. Next thing, we run our, we run our rope through an anchor puller ball this Easy Marine unit's probably the best on the market, and uh, you just run it through there, and it's got a one-way catch, so that when we pull the anchor, it hold, goes down, and then it holds our anchor right there, right at the ball. We use a proper length of rope, 300, 125, 150 feet of rope, whatever you use, use it consistently and let it all out so that you know how far you have to back into a line. You know, it just makes it a lot simpler. You can back into the lines or back into the anchor spot and consistency is a key there. Time and time again, pretty soon you know exactly how far to go forward to drop your anchor to get back into that spot. The next part of this anchor system is the knot that we tie. We tie a knot to connect the two ropes. Basically what we did is use two opposing knots and slid them together. A nail knot uh, is what that's called. This is good quality nylon rope. Th 3 8 inch rope is the standard, what everybody uses. Half inch is definitely overkill. The next part of the deal is the bumper. This is the end that we tie up to. We, this is nylon rope for our anchor rope. This is polypropylene rope for this. This floats, it's a plastic rope. So it floats and works really well. A lot of guys will attach a float on the end of the line. So when they flow the line, throw the line in, number one, it marks it. The other one, it, flows, or, uh, it floats it. This line also floats, so it's not mandatory that you do that because this will stay right on top of the water. You come back up, pick it up with your boat hook, hook up, and you're back on your mooring buoy. Once this system is all set, we have it in the water, you can, you, the boat does not stay with the anchor. You are free to throw everything over the side of the boat. The ball will float it. The float will drag down below that, so you're free to either run to the bank, um, to use the restroom, fight fish down the river, do whatever, and your ball, your rope, your anchor stays in the water, all accessible back to you. You can just come back, clip back onto it. Exactly. Like we say, the best way to analogize this is to say it is a mooring buoy. Absolutely. We're setting a mooring buoy, we're going to come tie up to it. Okay. And that's, that's the key. Perfect. There are all kinds of places you can set your anchor but the most difficult you will face is setting up in a hog line or row of other boats. This is where we'll demonstrate setting anchor. Like everything else with anchoring, Eric has a very specific way he goes about things, and he does it the same way every time so that there are no mistakes. How big is, is big enough to pull your boat into an anchor? Well, you, you want to come in so it's comfortable for the guys around you. Number one, I've, you know, we're only going to be fishing two rods here, but when I make my decision when I have a boatload of clients, I got to get be able to get five or six rods out of the boat and not tangle with these guys up here. So you, you want at least a, like a three boat opening there. So you got a, a boat's length width 
on each side of you at least in these lines up here. Um, what I think I'm going to do is, is go right in here. We're sitting in about 17 feet of water. We should be in about 16 feet of water right between these two boats here. Uh, I think we'll have plenty of room. We won't be crowding anybody, and uh, that's that's looking like the slot we want to go into. So even if you knew where you wanted to be fishing, you would still approach from below every time. It's it's generally the best rule. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Instead of just dropping the anchor and falling right in from the top, right, without getting the bearings the sense and everything. Of how everybody's sitting there. Yeah, well, you don't want to just go in and sit blind. Then then what I like about it is it it allows you to have the line that your anchor line is going to lay in. We just, just chug right up through here. We're not waking anybody out back here. We're just going to chug right up here, and the line that I'm on is the line that I'm going to want to lay my anchor line in, and it, it let, lets me see how close or far I'm going to be in or out of this line. Now, normally, you, you're when you're operating the boat on a guide trip, you have to do this all alone. So you need to be all set up, ready to go. So your gear is out on the deck in the front of the boat, and it's all ready to take place as we move through here. I have all my rope pulled through my puller so that I don't have to stand there and hold the puller. All I got to do is go up, let the, let the anchor rope out, and I can virtually walk back here and run the tiller if it's windy or something, just holding on to the rope and just lower myself right back into the, into the line. And then the only really thing that we need to worry about is whether we, you know, how much rope we have and how far you set back. And after you've done it a few times, we're using 125 foot rope today, after you've done it a few times, you just have a feel for it and it comes very simple. So preparedness is, like in all things, preparedness makes it all work better. By pulling that rope through that puller and just having the rope piled up there on top of itself the right way, you just try to take all the, you try to get eliminate all the problems that can happen and it makes everything so much simpler. I'll hold on. We're, we're here. We're about ready. We're lined up. We'll do some fine tuning. I'll run the motor for you and you can run the anchor. Up That'd front. be great. I'll go up front here and get things ready. Sounds good. What I like to do is I like to pull my anchor rope through all the way. Um, just pull it right on through the puller. We're going to bring the puller to the end of the rope where it meets up with the bumper section. And by doing that, that's going to slow things down for us a whole bunch. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second. But I get this rope pulled through there. And uh, we get it through one way. And what this is for is just so that everything goes really, really smooth and safely. I then set the ball down, because we're not going to need that for a minute, and then I coil this rope back onto itself so the rope comes off the top of the pile when I throw that anchor down. This just takes a, a minute more to do. Um, I know it's redundant, repetitive, but boy, is it the, it's the safest way to go with this. You can virtually anchor by yourself very, very easily, and uh, it really makes it simple. Uh, in windy conditions, you can even walk to the back of the boat or to your tiller or to your steering or helm station and, and uh, adjust your slide back. Now what I have is I have my chain all laid out here. All I have to do is push this anchor off when we're ready to go into the hole and, and, and we're ready to go. So it's just that easy. Looks like we need to be up a little further. Yeah, we need to go up a little bit further and we need to get right center of the hole. I want to be right dead between, between those two boats right there. When you have a good quality anchor... Uh, How about that? A little bit more to this side, Carmen. When you have a good quality anchor davit like this, it makes it a lot easier putting these anchors over, too. A little bit more, Carmen. A little bit more to the port side here. And I'm going to put it neutral and even a little reverse as we go back, yes. right? Yeah, that's correct. Keep, Keep off of that rope. Yep. Okay, I think I'm ready to go down. Here okay. we go. Okay, the anchor's on the bottom, and now the rope's I'm just... I'm in reverse, pulling off of that rope. The anchor's just... rope's just going out nice and slow. A couple things, if you have the luxury to do on this, Carmen, is you grab that rope and pull it and set that anchor. You give it a couple good pulls, and it helps pull all that chain and everything tight. And we're going to set right back in here. I think we did this pretty good. I think we're going to hit this just right. Give it a little forward, and we'll settle in soft on the anchor, let the pressure build on the rope, try and keep the anchor there. From slipping, yeah. With the, Just use the motor to set yourself back in there. Okay, we're going to get down here to where the ball's going to go out, and I like to just have it sitting there ready to go when it happens. We always keep the rope above us. And out goes the ball. 
And then we tie off on our bumper here to make ourselves even with the other boats down here. We want the back of our boat to be even with them. Just like that and tie her off and you're good to go. Once you are at anchor, there are a couple of things you can do to adjust your position slightly from side to side. The length of your bumper rope should allow you to keep yourself nicely lined up parallel with the other boats. For small adjustments in your spacing between boats, turning your motor slightly one way or the other can do the trick. In heavy currents, this can have little effect, and you may need to chalk your boat. Chalking is done by moving the position of your bumper rope on the bow. I see these in a lot of a lot of anchor boats that do this quite frequently that are set up and prepared. What are these hooks that are on either side of the bow? Yeah. They're chalks, they're anchor chalks. And what we do with those is I use that to fine tune my anchoring. A lot of times in a hog line, you'll set back into that hog line and you'll be too close to say the boat on the port or starboard side of you. So what you need to do is you just need to move over. What these do is they allow the boat to, to be chalked over, is what they call it, chalked over and and I've got three positions of adjustment. So, you know, one, I call it one click is a little bit, two clicks more, and three quick clicks is actually the a lot. The more extreme the, the place that you put it, the, the more farther you go. The more yeah. movement you get. <clears throat> that, that allows you to fine tune your position in the line, too. And once you have it set up, you just go right straight back to it. Now, what, what that does, or how you do it, is you would take and if you wanted to say, let's chalk to our left side here, you'd put it to the right and vice versa to go the other way. And what the wind messing with us a little bit here today, a real simple way to show you how that works is you just take your anchor line and you just take and come around here to the chalk and you can see how far off that ball we're going. So I mean, this is moving us over quite a ways. We've adjusted the, what we've done is adjusted the keel of the boat and used it as a rudder. And so now it's tracking us out to the side. Just like a big side planer for, for uh, fishing. And the other thing is, is on a 300 foot rope, you're gonna move a whole lot farther. When we put it to that third chalk, it doesn't only just move us between the ball and the boat, it's moving that rope underneath the water too. So we can move over a considerable distance depending on current and, and everything else. We're still moving out right now, as a matter of fact. On a shorter rope, it just doesn't move you as far. You have less, on a shorter rope, you have less, more, less of a pendulum effect. So if you needed to, you could cover water. If you got close with your anchor, but you weren't really sure that that's exactly where you wanted to be, you can use these. They're a cheap accessory, inexpensive to either. These were built with the boat. There's also bolt-on items that are the same. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how you, in an anchoring situation you'd live without them. So good accessory item to the whole system. Got to have really it. really makes it work well. Yep. Another method of keeping your boat spaced where you want in line is to use sea acres. Essentially, these are just like big bags with holes in the bottom that you throw over and tie off on either or both sides of the stern. They can keep you exactly where you want to be, but you have to keep in mind they will put additional drag on your anchor, and you have to be set firm to use them. We've looked at the chocks in the front of the boat that help us help, do, allow you to fine tune position side to side, but there's nothing more frustrating when you're anchor fishing. Maybe you have a wind coming from the back or the side, and the inability to keep the back of the boat straight really makes it difficult for fishing. You've got some stuff to combat that. Well, what you run into, you know, in an open boat like this, it's not as bad, although it is, it is a problem. You get guys with tops and windshields and stuff. What you need is a, basically a glorified wind sock. What this does is it goes down in the water, it opens up like this, and then it drags you and keeps you tight on your anchor rope. Now, there's going to be times when you can't use them because of, uh, well, for instance, if it's a tough anchoring situation, it'll actually pull you off anchor. But generally, this will work really good. And it, it can also be used in conjunction with your chocks to chalk over even more or to hold your boat straight. So there's a couple different uses for it. You can put it on one side of your boat with the anchor lines down straight down the middle, and it'll act like a chalk and pull you to that side. So you can fine tune in the hog lines just using this. If you're gonna, if, if that's in a hog line is a problem, you need to put out two of them, one on each side to balance yourself. And that'll hold you straight and that wind can be blown against you and the pressure of the water on those sea bags pulls that you tight on that anchor rope and keeps you straight. So it works really well. And what I do with these is I just use a little brass snap like this, about three feet of line and then they come with their own bridle. 
And then a lot of times what I'll do is put a float on here, a small football type float that's on here. So if it ever does drop off, you can get your sea anchor back. They have a trailering loops on the back of your boat. And I, all I like to do is just clip those on there. It's real quick and easy. You want to do that for me? Sure. As it fills up with water, it's going to drag us straight. So that puts a heck of a lot of pressure in this fast current. Yeah, now you can see we're not swinging around near as much as we were in this wind than before we did that. So that just gathers up all that extra current for us. If the current was real slow, that would just suck a whole bunch more pressure back there. Right. In Keeps this fast water, we don't rope. notice it as much, but in slow water, really put some pressure on the anchor to keep you straight. Well, and in this wind, you know, as, as the wind blows here, I mean, it keeps you nice and straight. And in the slower water, you can actually clip another one on there and it really keeps you going good. Then when we're fishing out the back, we don't have the swing, our bait stay in one spot, it makes for better fishing. That's right, not dragging around. We're going to pull this anchor now, Eric. This is the best part about these whole systems, is their ability to pull the anchor without using manpower, but using the power of the motor and the boat to do it. It's also the most dangerous aspect of using these systems, and kind of explain that and, and how, they, how to do it the right way. Well, number one, I always tie off the front of my boat. There's a million discussions about you pull from the front, you pull from the back. For my money, it's always best to pull from the bow of the boat. Reason being, if something did happen, you're not tied off to the back where you're on risk of, of getting turned around backwards in this current and sinking. And that's, that's what the problem usually is. The other deal is, is that when we get ready to pull, we'll take that rope off that chalk, we'll lay it right down the middle of that anchor davit. I'm gonna start up the motor. I like to pull, I run my tiller with my left hand, so I like to pull with the ball to my port side or my left side here so I can watch it go. I can see the rope off the corner of my boat. What I like to do is just pull out around the ball, keep it, keeping it to my left side here, and just motor up an imaginary line parallel with the rope that's already in the water. Now in this instance today, since we got these guys here, I don't want to, once I get the rope up, I don't want to just cut the motor and try coiling the rope in. Because so we'll start moving we'll, back we'll down the river. moving right back down on top of them, and, and I see that happen all the time. What we're going to do is we're going to pull up, and then I'm going to pull it right out into the big, out into the big river out here, and then I can slowly just bring it in and take care of it. The key there is making sure that your anchor's all the way up so you're not grabbing these anchor lines as, as we're going across. I see guys, they start heading for the buoy out in front of the boat and they go straight over the top of it, it seems like. Right, and right. And they bring that rope, because we have to pull the, the rope, get the rope upstream of the anchor to pull it, so it's gonna come beyond the side of the boat. I see them get that rope, seems like it's coming right down, right down, right down, and eventually could potentially get right here. You need to run an imaginary parallel line. Here's one anchor line. Here's where our anchor line lays. We're going to run out here six, eight feet to the other side of it so that we don't have any chance of getting it. And your anchor line will actually loop around like this to the ball. And you can see it right here, and it's all pretty safe deal. Should be easy doing. OK. Let's Let me do flip it. that line over there. We'll pull this thing. OK. I'm going to run that motor. So here comes the ball. It's going to come it's right down, down the, the side. side. I can boat. see the rope and the water right on the side of the boat here. It's up and it's away from the big motor. Now see, I can keep my eye right there on that rope as that ball slides down there. Our anchor line's over there about six, eight feet. So it's away. now the rope's all away from a prop and everything. We just slowly motor up the hill here. And you can tell when that ball, if you notice that ball sliding back, you'll, you'll notice a distinct change. That ball will start coming with us. It'll start moving. And so it starts a shimmying step. a little in the water. Right, right. So you know that the ball's up. Then you can take and make your turn. We got plenty of room in here today to do this. In the springtime, a lot of times anchor fishing on the, on the river here, uh, when they're so close, we do this pull it by hand. But, but because we got all this room, we're not, we're not affecting anybody's gear above us. We're going to go ahead and use this ball to pull this time. As we're looking at that rope, if you had to pull this by hand, that'd be a heck of a job. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Against the current, everything else. So, so this, is, this, this is the this real. Came up. Now, it's, now it's coming with us. 
So this is really the greatest part about these whole systems, right? Well, here. from my standpoint, pulling it sometimes several times a day, this is just wonderful. I'll tell you. We're going to go out here. What I'm going to do is pull this out into the river, and then what I want you to do is I'll turn the boat around. You just idle me back down to that ball. It makes it very simple for me to pull that to pull that in, and uh, should be no problem. And so that anchor is hanging immediately under that ball right there. Right. And we you, came across those ropes. We are in no danger. No. Their ropes are down sunk. We're in no danger of hooking them up. We're, our anchor's probably eight feet below that, and it's probably at an angle, so we're, we're okay. You gotta be really careful in this instance right here that you be careful with that. And you, we don't wanna float down on top of those other boats. I mean, I can't tell you how critical that is. I see it happen several times every year. People misjudge this current like you cannot believe. All so, right, I'm gonna turn this thing around. I'll go up here on the bow and, and pick that rope up, and you, uh, you idle me down there. Okay. Give her some gas, Carmen, and come on, idle right, drive right to it. There you go. That wind's kind of tough. I'm just going to back off as we get to the ball here. Yeah, I want you to hit, go ahead and just put her in idle, and it'll come right up. We're in neutral. Just like that, we're done. Got all our equipment back safely, and we're ready to roll. That really is a neat way to go. I mean, there's nothing better. If the lines of boats are so close to each other that you don't have room to use your boat as a puller, it is a simple matter of moving the boat forward slowly and hauling in the anchor. Practicing with no one else around is by far the best way of getting familiar with setting your anchor and practice is something you should do before trying to move in and anchor in crowded fishing conditions. It seems like there might be a lot to remember about anchoring, but it is a relatively simple procedure once you have assembled the right gear and practiced the techniques Eric and Carmen have demonstrated. Safe and proper anchoring is something you'll never regret learning and something you wish everyone else was aware of. You guys ready? Here we're going out. Yeah. The lucky R. What we got here? Hang on, I'll get this other rod in. I'll grab that net. We'll slide over here to the inside. You coming in okay? Good and heavy. There it is. Move up. Let, let's drag him outside here, Carmen. Get out of this other line. That's all right. We'll get out of the other line here. Fishing at anchor in a river is so popular because it puts you exactly where you need to be to intercept runs of fish. It allows you to be at the right depth and in the right part of the river. Let's see if we can't land this fish. And it ensures that your bait or lures are being effective almost 100% of the time. Let me turn this boat into that. I saw it. Here it comes. There. Looks like a keeper, and there she goes. We are going to cover techniques for both salmon and steelhead and leave sturgeon angling methods for another video. The first thing we're going to talk about is the rig Eric uses to fish for salmon. The hatchery fish. Is so it? This one's no one for the box. You've got it already? I'm right sorry. here. There you go. Let's see Dandy. Got. Let's see what we got here. No nubbin. We're there, baby. We're in. <laughs> All right. Summer Chinook. Oh. Straighten his eyes out. Oh, that's a dandy. Right on. You can't play. We just built that spinner. I mean, just built that spinner, put it out five seconds before that wing went over. Keep in mind his gear for anchor fishing steelhead is configured oh exactly the same as for salmon only everything is just a little bit lighter for steelhead. What I like, first of all, is a fairly stiff rod. This is an eight and a half foot, extra heavy, 15 to 50 rated rod, line rating rod. 
Um, I like the stiffness for the hook set. I couple that with a, this is a 6500 Garcia reel um, loaded with 50 pounds spectra fiber line. And the spectra fiber line <clears throat> has virtually no stretch. So on, when the fish hit, we're, we're, we're sitting still. So when this fish comes up and hits and turns sideways and runs, the stiff rod and the no stretch in the line help hook set these fish. I mean, it really sets the hook good on them. Good sharp hook, we get the hook in them good, and, and we, our hookups are a lot better. So we've got a stout rod and some stiff line, some heavy, no stretch line. How do we get into the rigging of the actual terminal tackle? Well, uh, really, I, I like to keep it as simple as I can. It's just a lot easier, fewer things to go wrong or to be broken. So what I do is I just put a bead, this bead above my sliders, basically just to, so my stuff doesn't get reeled through the tip of my rod a lot of times. People get excited when they're fighting these fish and they just keep reeling when, it, when it's all the way in. That just protects the tip of my rod. The next thing I use is a slider to put my uh, lead dropper line on. And that slider, a lot of times with these long lead lines, especially when you're using like a five foot lead line, you go to net the fish, you get that lead tangled up in your net. Now the fish takes off on another run, the lead, it isn't going to knock your fish off. So this is just a little bit of an insurance policy here. The next thing that we go to is just another bead spacing and, and a bumper and then I like to use this windshield washer tube out of a car it's just a little piece of rubber tubing vacuum line type tubing slides down over and protects your knot from the lead line and everything beating around here <clears throat> the next thing I use is a bead chain swivel either a four or a six bead bead chain swivel and because we're anchor fishing everything's down there constantly spinning and moving I like to use that just to keep the tangles and everything out of out of there and that, that really, really adds a lot. Just a simple swivel isn't enough. You need a bead chain. A lot of times you get weeds and grasses on there, and it, if, if you don't have that bearing in there, it really tangles up. The next thing that we use is our leader. Um, again, everybody scoffs at me, but, but I like running a heavy leader. We run either 40, 50, or 60 pound leaders, um, kind of depending on the baits, but most of the baits that we're using in anchor fishing this, this is not a, a situation where diameter or, or visibility is, is a key issue. So I prefer not to lose them. One thing that I get, and, and everybody kind of laughs at me a little bit, but I get these quick fish and these lures tuned. I get, I get lures that are working. Half the reason I use heavy leaders is because I don't want to lose the lure. You know, I don't want it to get broke off or have the leader break. And, and the, the other thing is, is that the impact of the actual hook set is such that a 20 or even 25 pound leader sometimes will break. Even if it's abraded a little bit, it'll pop. And this just gives me an extra factor of safety from the landing and keeping my good lures. The length of your dropper line, how does that define, how does that play a role in your fishing? Once you find out where those fish are running, then we adjust this lead line to position the lure above the bottom so that it best puts the lure right in, in the face of the fish. And in the springtime, I'm running anywhere from a 14 to a 24 inch dropper. This time of year, very similar deal, you know, 20, 24 inch droppers. In the fall, we'll run as much as five feet of lead line when we're out in 40, 45 feet of water. We've got some different size weights here. How did we choose, how did we choose which ones work for us there? Well, the different size of weights predicate how you get your lure out because generally what we're going to do is we're going to walk that lure out uh, or back what they call back bounce it out and you need to pick a lure that or excuse me you need to pick a lead that will you can lift up and bounce backwards so that this leads actually you're lifting it up off the bottom and we're moving it back and what we want to get is we want to achieve a pretty decent line angle we want a scope or an angle on your line angle going out there a ways and you want to position that lure oh some 35 to 50 yards behind the boat and a lot of that's so that we're not swinging back and forth like this and, and dragging your lures and hanging them up or, or changing the position or having them lift off the bottom so you need two things you need a lure that allow or a lead that allows you to bounce that lure back plus it needs to stay right on the bottom and I get asked this question all the time this lead needs to remain right on the bottom when you're fishing you don't want this thing floating up or the current swift enough to lift your your lead off the bottom. You have to have enough lead to hold that thing right on the bottom. When we get to our lure choice, we've got some different selections here. How do you actually make the choice as to what you're going to put out for the day? Uh, a lot of that's predicated on the water speed. Um, water speed is critical to, to the action of the lures and whether they'll even work. Uh, a lot of times anchor fishing, 
you've got water that's running so hard that you can't get certain lures to work. Today we've got all spinners out because we're in pretty fast water and they work in the fast water. It, they'll work when nothing else will. Um, as the water slows down, we switch, we switch or can switch to the quick fish and they really work good. Um, probably your number one lure on the Columbia for spring Chinook are these quick fish right here. Um, the other thing is water temperature. As the water warms up, the fish key on different things like big wobblers um, like this, um, sometimes quick fish, but primarily a metal show in the summer and late fall, or fall when the water's really, really warm and, and it slows way down in the rivers, the waters drop in the summer and then we switch to the wobblers. This is what Eric's terminal gear looks like when it's sitting on the bottom. His main line is angled down towards his rig. There are beads on both sides of his slider, above to keep from reeling the gear into the tip of the rod, and below to protect the knot. Below the second bead and in front of the bead chain swivel, he puts a piece of rubber tubing that acts as a bumper to further protect his knot. The slider rests in between, and it helps to keep everything from tangling. Coming straight down off the bottom of the slider is the lead line. The lead sinkers rest on the bottom and Eric prefers the balls rather than the pyramids because they allow him to walk the rig into position. Attached to the main line is the bead chain swivel, which keeps line twists at a minimum. The leader comes off the end of the swivel. The main line Eric prefers for both salmon and steelhead is the newer braided spectra that offers greater strength with smaller diameters. He likes to have at least 150 yards spooled on his reel. The fine diameter lines make it easier to get your rig down and keep it there because it has less drag in the water. For salmon, he fishes 50 pound test. For steelhead, he will use 30 to 50 pound test. His leaders are monofilament and will vary in length depending upon the water clarity and how close he wants to keep his lures or baits to the bottom. His general rule is between 54 and 60 inches. The strength of his leaders are similar to that of his main lines, 40 to 60 pound test for salmon and 20 to 30 pound test for steelhead. The lead dropper lines are all 25 pound test and vary in length depending upon where he believes the fish to be traveling in the water column. In the spring and late fall when both salmon and steelhead are relatively close to the bottom, his lead droppers run 14 to 24 inches. In the summer when the water warms and the salmon are more likely to be suspended, his lead dropper line will be between three and five feet. The weight of the sinkers you use will depend upon the speed of the current you're fishing. The faster the current, the more weight you're going to need. In slower tide water and lower river situations, Eric will be using between one to four ounces of lead. When flows are heavy in the main river, he can use as little as six ounces and as much as 16. Once you have all your terminal gear set up, you need to put your rods out. And again, Eric has a very specific way he puts out and sets up his rods in the boat. Well, what I like to do, and I'll fish up to six rods this way, is I like to, to basically run them all across the back. I'll run four across the back. I run these two rods in the center here out long. Those are my long rods. Um, then the next two are, I bring back in a little bit. And if I go and fish five or six, I'll put them in rod holders up in front, and I drop those with real heavy leads. I mean, if I'm using six or eight ounces here, I'll use 10 or 12 there and just bounce them a few times back and just set them back. And, and there, it's, it's the neatest bite there is because it just buries the rod right to the side of the boat. That way I've got this spread all set up and, and when we get a fish on one of these lines, it doesn't tangle into the other lines. We can clear all the lines and get them out of the way and, and then go fish. I'm going to go ahead and bounce this rod out here and uh, kind of give you the idea how to do that. Basically what we're going to do is we just want to take and get it out there. This is going to be a, a shorter rod, so I don't have to bounce it that far. I make sure that the lure's working and that everything's straight. And then I just let her down to the bottom. Feel it hit the bottom. I'm feeling bottom real good. I just let out a little line. And I'm just lifting it up and letting the current take that lead back down the river. And get her down there a ways. Get a little line angle on it. So if we're going back and forth, it's not dragging the lure around or hanging it up. Anyway, once we get it out there, you just reel it in and sit back and wait for it to go off. A lot of times what I'll do too is on these anchor fisheries, is a lot of these reels will have a clicker or a line alarm on them and I'll take and slide the line alarm on so that if it, if it does go off, we have an audible on it, I can turn around and find out what's going on or what's happening with that particular lure. And then you always want to check your drag to make sure that it's 
it's uh, set properly and you're ready to go. How tight do you like to have that drag set? And my my scene is three quarter tight. If if no line or hardly any line peeling off at all is tight and free spool is it, I like to be three quarters of the way there. So fairly tight drag comes off there pretty hard. These big fish, these fish, these salmon will strip that line no problem. But boy, that really helps set that hook. One thing that one thing that you want to do a lot of times, and I and I see people do over and over again, is the minute that rod even tips down, they grab it and set the hook. Especially with quick fish, even wobblers are this way. It's really good to let that fish take and just bury that that down. With the way that I've got it set up, with the stiffer rod, no stretch line, when that rock fish hits, if you let that fish just continue to pull that rod down, he just he just hook sets himself more and more and more. And a lot of times, especially with quick fish, if you yank on that thing too early, you're going to miss that fish. You're going to pull that lure right out of his mouth. So I like to really let him bury it down. By the time we got all the talking done, played with anchors and looked at the gear, the bite was off. Eric had to take us out a second day to catch us another fish and tell us about the baits and lures he uses. Carmen didn't make this trip, but a couple of Eric's clients did. No, no, no not you. Get the other rod. Real, real, real. Just keep reeling. The final element to the formula for catching salmon and steelhead at anchor is what you put on the end of the line, your baits or lures. It could take years to go over everything that has been created, but we'll just stick with Eric's favorites. We'll get him. I just got to get these rods cleared and we'll, and we'll get him. How and where we fish for spring, summer, and fall salmon, and summer and winter steelhead has to do mostly with water temperatures. As a very general rule, the faster and cooler the water, the more likely the salmon and steelhead are to take baits and lures, or lures with baits added. This means water temperatures somewhere below 62 degrees. In warm water, above 62 degrees, hardware works better. Things like spinners and wobblers are more likely to do the trick. Where we look for fish is also affected by water temperature. Now, this, Both salmon and steelhead will travel in shallower water when it's cooler. You get it, you this is usually in the spring you and later in the fall. In the summer, when the water warms, they move more slowly up the river and can be found in deeper water and at river mouths that have cooler flows. For this reason, we're going to group spring and late fall salmon together in our detailed description of where and how you fish them. Summer Chinook will have their own category, as will steelhead. Keep in mind, your methods have more to do with water temperature than species. We'll start with spring and late fall salmon. These are traveling fish, and they'll be close to the bottom in water depths of 10 to 20 feet. These salmon like inside bends to shorten their trip upriver, and flats where there's an even flow in constant depth. Another good spot is in current seams between soft water and slower currents. Generally, you'll be dealing with swifter flows in the spring, and this will affect your choice of lures. Spinners are a popular choice in the spring because they track well in fast-moving water. This means they hold their place in the flow and don't whip around. Many anglers will rig these with a variety of baits, prawns and shrimp being some of the most popular. Spinner sizes should be number fours and number fives, even smaller if the water is extremely fast. As far as colors go, Eric's number one choice would be a gold blade with chartreuse bead body. He also likes rainbow spinners with either green, orange, or blue tip. In his arsenal, he will have a variety of colors to go along with his favorites because he says the fish will change their preference just when you least expect it. In tidal waters and slower flows down near river mouths, Eric will go to wobblers and quick or flatfish for spring chinook. His wobblers are small to medium, and his top choices are Simon, Kalur, and Manistee, in colors similar to his spinners, gold or silver with chartreuse or green accents. With the right conditions, he will use quick fish in sizes 14 and 15, and flatfish in sizes M2 or T50. His favorite colors for these lures are combinations of silver, green, and chartreuse. Eric will always wrap his quick fish and flatfish with bait. This is a good general spread of spring chinook lures. Um, 
They're used everywhere from the Rogue River all the way up to the Columbia, everywhere else for these spring Chinook anchor fisheries, which is really our, our trophy prize salmon. Um, the different lures might be used in different situations concerning water speed or, or tidal effect. Um, spinners like this are generally used in your fast water conditions, although they can be used in slow. They work the best uh, when, when you're up in really fast ripping water and you need a lure that will that will produce and fish in, in the faster water speeds where wobblers will spin around. Spinners can lay in that fast water and really spin. Um, if you see one trend here that developing is that chartreuse for spring chinook is, is just a key. Very, very good color. Um, so you'd use the spinners in, in real fast water. Wobblers, um, while they used to be way, way more uh, important years ago, when I first got into the tackle business, everybody would be fishing three and a half, four manistees. Um, this is a new Simon wobbler that comes out. There's the Simon, the K lure, uh, obviously the manistees, which, which most of these are derived from commercial trolling spoons. Um, these work wonderful, especially in the tidal area, in the lower river, from mouth, the mouth of the Willamette down or in a gentler current, where the lure action needs to be like this. If these wobblers get to where they're spinning over, you need to go to another to another lure. And, and what would cause them to spin is, is the water running so hard. So these are more uh, effective in a tidal current or in a, in a little bit slower paced water. Um, probably the lure that has revolutionaries, this anchor fishing on the Columbia River especially, is the a, is a quick fish or the flat fish. Um, they make different sizes from the K13 to the K16, uh, T4 up to the T55 flatfish are all good sizes. Personally, I like the K15s, but again, the K16s, the K14s, M2s, T50 flatfish all work good. These five colors here are probably my top colors, and if I could only have one, it would be this uh, Lure Gents in the 747 with the chartreuse and, and green butt on it. It's been uh, money for me in the last few years. Same with the double troubles here. They, they're very good lures. There are a lot of other colors that work. A lot of people, you gotta fish what you have confidence in, but these have been good lures for me. Next in their line of species to target anchor fishing are steelhead. They choose a little shallower water to travel in both the spring and the fall, preferring only eight to 16 feet of depth. They like to follow the banks. Other preferred spots are at the edges of shallow bars and the mouths of rivers. Eric has one choice for anchor fishing steelhead, and that is spinners. He likes the smaller sizes, number threes and number fours, and red is his preferred color. A red blade with red beads is his number one color, and this is followed by copper or silver blades with red beads. Again, he'll have a variety of other colors on hand in case the bite changes. But when they are biting and the water's reasonable temperature, um, these are some of the lures that really work well. Production lures that you can buy right out of the store are like Warden's Flash and Glows here. This is a uh, size 124. It's a uh, red blade, red beads with, it's non-weighted. They make weighted and non-weighted. This has just got beads on it so it's non-weighted and won't fall down uh, on your leader and drag in the mud. The Lure Jensen Clearwater Flash Spinners, again in red. On this fishery here, one thing you might notice is that they're hit, a lot of times they key on this red color, red beads, copper blades, like so, uh, is a real popular, popular lure. Um, and the size, if you notice the size, generally a smaller spinner. We get down to a number four Hildebrandt blade here, the number four G spots, number three backmores, all very small blades. Um, color combinations vary. Sometimes it's, it's silver copper with green beads. You need to really have a pretty good arsenal. A lot of these are my homemade spinners that we've made to fish out here, and then we start switching them out to see which ones work. And sometimes the green will go in the morning and red and copper in the afternoon when the sun's out and bright. Um, and, it, and, and that's kind of the difference. With these, it'll change year to year, but this general pattern right here will give you an arsenal good enough to start with the summer steelhead. The summer and early fall salmon travel deeper in the river and are not in the hurry that the early fish are. 
they are seeking cooler water temperatures that they can find in deep runs, holes, and at river mouths. For some reason, these fish are not attracted to baits, but rather have to be enticed with hardware. Eric's first choice is wobblers. These big, flat, spoon-like lures gently flutter in the current. There are a variety of them on the market, including Clancy's, Brad's, Alvin's, Simon's, and others. Eric will use all of them from time to time. Regardless of your choice, Eric likes the large sizes. His choice of colors are silver or chrome, accented with green, blue, or red. Spinners are another good producer at this time of year, and the big sevens and eights with broad and heavy blades are his best producers. Some of his favorite colors are the red and white blade with red beads, the copper with dark red beads, and a variety of rainbow spinners, including the green, orange, and blue tips. As soon as the water temperatures start to cool, Eric will immediately go back to using bait wrap quick fish or flatfish. Um, in the fast water, again, your spinners are working, your rainbows, copper reds, rainbows. Um, this size, these big, this big red and white blade is more of a fall blade in the spinners stuff. Summertime has brought our water flows down, the water temperatures are way up, and that's when we evolve back into wobblers. And the wobblers seem to work in the higher water temperatures, and it really keeps a bite on these big Chinooks coming in. They all tend to work fairly well. One thing that you can see in, a, say, a Clancy wobbler is that they have three different weights of blade, a lightweight, a medium, and a heavy blade, and it's just the thickness of the material. What that does for you is the faster the current, the heavier the, the material you go to, the lighter the current, the lighter the weight of the deal so that you get the proper action on the lure, and you want that lure to go back and forth like this. The other keys on, on the wobblers is the, the different color tapes. They have painted ones. This is a, a white fade to chartreuse tip. One of the things that I like to do, and probably the easiest thing to do, is to, again just to take your mylar tape and just add different colors, greens, reds, blues. Probably for my money, these chrome blue, for whatever reason, seem to be the best, do the best for me. Later as the fall moves on, we'll move into these big cascade spinners. Um, especially anchored in the lower river, up in the mouth of the cowlitz and stuff, these and green, red and whites and chartreuses really produce, especially on the salmon. As the summer progresses and the water temperatures drop, like here we are in the middle of September, we got water temperatures down around 66 degrees, what we've been getting them on the best is we're back to quick fish again. And the quick fish seem to be working. We have the sardine wrap on there, and we've got the bite coming on that, that bait wrap plug. We've, we've, we've moved away from the wobblers a little bit. There is little doubt what Eric's favorite lure is if the conditions allow him to fish it. That is the quick or flat fish wrapped with sardine fillets. He feels it has revolutionized salmon fishing in the Northwest. If the water's not too fast or too warm, he has one on. He shows us how to wrap the sardines on these lures. Um, what I like to use is sardines, and I like the smaller size sardines, uh, a six to seven inch sardine, and I just flay the sides off of them. And then I get two, two wraps out of each one, and I use this, this tail one. All I do is cut them in half, and then I'm gonna trim them up so they fit on the bottom of that, of that lure. And I'm just thinning them up, trimming them up, Got to get them, what you're trying to do in this, this pretty fast water we're sitting in here, especially springtime, it'll be faster. That we're, we're here in the fall, but uh, then I slice that like so. And then I slide that up onto the body of the lure like so. Pinch that together. And this is called Miracle Thread. And it's just a latex thread you can get in most tackle shops. And I like it because it keeps a wrap in place. And then I just start wrapping on the front here. Wrapping back, slide the hook back. You need, I run a good single on there, just usually in the springtime, just because I have to release fish. And then I just wrap back like so. Just make sure it's on there good. If you have to adjust it at any time so that it'll run true, you can just take the stuff and slide your fingers and get it running straight and true so you don't have to tune the quick fish as much. And then you just take the thread and run it over your fingers. Take a half inch once, half inch twice, and just break it and you're done. And now you got a, a quick fish that's wrapped, ready to go. 
As important as putting your bait wrap on properly is tuning the lure. It has to be running true if it's going to get bit. What you're looking for is a consistent wobble back and forth and for the lure to be running straight. You don't want it headed off to one side or the other. Okay, we're getting ready to put in here and the uh, thing I like to do when I got multiple rods going out is uh, to run different size leads. I run, I always run one rod real long. What we're trying to do is just avoid the tangles. And uh, when you're anchor fishing, we got wind blowing today, the boat's swaying back and forth to the side. I'll run one with a light lead. This is six ounce lead right here. And I'll run them out there. Every time I wrap these, I check the tune on them and adjust the tune here so that the plugs run straight. Uh, this plug was running out to the side to, to my left, so we're gonna adjust the eye back to the right just a little bit. It only takes a little bit. I'm just turning, all I do is grab it with the pliers. It's a threaded eye screw, basically, and you just bend it so that now, now see I went too far, it's coming back the other way. And what that does is it pulls from one side or the other of the plug. So I'm turning the eye on the on the bill of the plug. I, I, if there's a brand new plug and it popped too far, and, and we're talking just little bits makes a huge difference. Now, for the most part, that plug's running real true. Now, what I'm going to do is take this lead. When we're when we're fishing, this lead sits right on the bottom at the side of the boat where the bottom. This lead would sit on the bottom, so you got to make sure that this is enough weight to hold that lead down, and then the plug sits back here and runs. And so that's what we're doing. And we're going to run this one's going to be in this rod holder right here. We're going to run this, this rod long, so we're going to bounce it. Go to the bottom and stop. Stop your spool so you find your lead, and then just bounce it back there. I'm lifting up and letting line out as I go back. We haven't touched too much on sturgeon or silver salmon techniques, two other species that can be targeted while anchor fishing. Regardless of what you are after, you will find that fishing at anchor can be extremely productive. Our hope is that you've learned some things about how to anchor fish and that you'll invest in the equipment and the time to practice. Eric, with proper use of this setup, you can really access a lot of water, catch a lot of fish, and do it safely. So really all the good pieces of the puzzle there are there for anglers to go out and really put this system to good use. Well, you know, and the deal is, is that once you take the time to set up a system, you go practice with it. And if I can tell you one thing to do, if you haven't used it before, go out and find yourself some slow water. You don't want to come up, say, in fast water or a ripping tide somewhere and decide it's time to learn how to use that puller system. Go out, find some nice calm water with a little bit of current in it, drop your anchor, prepare the ropes the way we talked, have your chain ready, have everything ready, drop it over the side, set back, set onto the anchor, then pull the anchor, and maybe do it a couple, three times just so that you have the drill down, and also do it with your fishing buddies so you all know how it works. That way also, when you go into a congested fishery, I hear a lot of complaints from anglers out there from people that haven't taken the time to do that. They haven't gone out, practiced, they come into a crowded fishery, it's a big fishery of the year, that they figure, okay, it's time to learn. They learn in the wrong environment, upset other people, makes for bad, bad days on the water for a lot of different people involved, and all that can be avoided. If you follow the steps that we've laid out here, it'll be simple, no-brainer to anchor and to anchor safely, and you'll do it just fine around people. It shouldn't be a problem at all.